We've talked before about this observation feedback and involving the fit to observations. So that's what we're essentially providing are these numbers for how far was the observation from the background. And we do this for all the observations that that went into the system. So we have a large sample of observations and how far was the background from the observations. And once you have a large sample, you can start doing statistics like means and standard deviations, root mean square, etc. One of the ways in which people start to use this is to say, we can start looking at consistency checks now because not only do we have the statistics of these differences, um, we actually have some idea what that distribution should look like. If you take something like the difference between two distributions, you know that the variance is not the sum of the variances, right? The variances of the observations added to the variance of the, of the background. But each of those variances are actually information that go into the data assimilation system. We call them the observation error and the background error. That's all part of giving uh, the appropriate weight to the observations is to, is to know something about the errors that, that are involved in each of these things. So having uh, made some choices about what we thought the errors were, we then have a way of looking at the consistency later on by saying, if we add up these errors, it shouldn't look too different from the variance we get from this distribution. So that's, that's one of the standard things that people do when, we, when they start looking at these, these differences. So background errors, you know, you go to the people who, who develop the forecast models and you ask about the uncertainties and, and you put that together with you know, what's known about data assimilation and you, and you have these numbers you know, provided in different ways. For the observation error, you tend to go to the people who build the instruments and know about you know, what are the imperfections in them and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can take two numbers here, you, you add them together, you then compare it with, with this and you get these sorts of um, uh, comparisons here. So if everything was fully consistent, these two things would line up on top of each other. So there's a couple of things that you can see is that sometimes the the differences that you actually see in blue are less than what you thought the errors would be. So actually, the observations that background are much closer than the error specification. Um, so in some sense, we've overestimated the errors, um, or we've been a little bit conservative about, about, about you know, how good the observations are or how good the background is. Um, in some sense, we prefer that situation to this other situation, which is that we thought that the errors were at this level, but in practice we find the disagreements at that level. Um, so in some sense, we're like overconfident about, about the, the quality of the observations or the model. So I sort of say we prefer that situation. In some ways, we, we really try to make use of this information. That, that's, that, that's a sign of imperfection in the system somewhere. We have, these are the sorts of questions that we have to sort of say, you know, there's an inconsistency. We need to revise our understanding. Why, why are these differences bigger than what we thought they might be? It prompts us to ask, were there imperfections in the observations that we hadn't considered yet? Maybe there's some missing, missing factors that um, you know, make the observations less perfect than we thought they were. Uh, or, or conversely, it could be the background uh, is maybe more uncertain than before. So differences here are other things that tell us about weaknesses in the system that can we seek to improve. Uh, you could actually argue this, this way around as well, that any, any gap between blue and red is, is something to be, to be improved on because in some sense they should lie on top of each other. So if we're being, if we're being too harsh on the on the observations or the background by being too conservative about their, their, their errors, maybe we should um, essentially revise that and sort of say we should have more confidence in the observations and background than we ever thought. And there's no harm in improving things in that direction either. So this is a bit like the, the case of the budget closure, isn't it? We deliberately leave things like this in there as our diagnostics for where the things for improvement. So, you know, we wouldn't artificially make these things lie on top of each other.
but by letting them do their own thing and finding out whether they, they do lie on top of each other, that's our measure of whether things are self-consistent or not. We are going to go to that. I wanted to bring this up because once people start getting a hold of these observations and backgrounds, these will be the sorts of things they want to do. Um, to, to begin with, they'll be very surprised if they don't agree, but there's a reason for that. And one thing I would say, actually, is that even once that's understood why we allow these to be different, there's another thing that comes up, which is that we take background errors and we take what are normally known as instrument errors, where people think about um, all the imperfections in the, in the instrument itself. Uh, and when you add those two up, what typically happens is you're, you're more in this situation that you add these two numbers up and you get values that are lower than what we see in practice. And there's a third thing you need to take into account, which is, sort of, is, is the thing that I said, you know, you, you struggle if you, if you haven't been sort about this before or been told about it, which is that there's, a, there's this concept called representativity error or representativeness error. So can I just see how many people have come across that term before? One, two, yeah. Okay, three, that's good. So I think we'll rely on, on these two people from FMI to, to explain in more detail to all the others. Um, but if you don't know about it, you you just you just really puzzle about, about how these things can be so different. And just as a starting point, I would say, in a nutshell, it's to do with it's to do with models and observations measuring things on rather different scales. So if you think about a model grid box as being like the average value over, a, over an area, maybe you know, 40 kilometers by 40 kilometers, the model tries to tell you what is the average value over that, over that region. Whereas if you think about two radio songs or two pressure sensors that you might put anywhere in there, you wouldn't expect the two pressure sensors to always give you the same value, because you know there's much there's much <coughs> smaller scale detail that they pick up, um, which would different be different depending on where you are in the grid box, right? So individual point measurements don't tell you the same thing as an area average. So. So you are measuring two things at, at very different scales, and you need to take that into account uh, when, when the, these, the differences need to reflect that as well. So there's a, there's a third term in here, which is to do with that difference in scales. In practice, we don't write a third term because that term is, is absorbed either in here or in here. Um, so it's not written separately, but you have to remember that just taking the instrument error, if you were to only write the instrument error here, uh, you would need to um, put a third term for representativeness. Um, what we do in practice is to add the instrument error and the representativeness error together and call it something of an like observation error. And people get very confused about why we've added it to the observation and not to the background, which I don't want to go into right now, but I just, I just stick to the point that if you, if you, if you, if you only include background error and instrument error, you'll never get these two things to agree. So that, that's enough of an, of an idea that representativeness will be needed to, to be taken into account. And it's something we followed up later. So I just don't want you to get stuck at looking at the contradiction between these, these statistics and instrument error plus background error. So that's to avoid pitfalls later on. So now, now let me go back to the, the very practical. These two terms, you could certainly actually accept if you work through the equations. By two terms, do you mean do you mean this whole red thing in the square root and yeah. and this thing here? Yeah. Because in the simulation process, actually, the base determines they are based on the two arrows. Strictly speaking, yeah. what you should if you want to have something match up with this red thing, I should have written standard deviation here. So in other words, I should have subtracted off the mean difference first. Uh, when you look at these things, sometimes you want to like separate out the systematic error from the, from the random error. Um, 
Here, I, I wrote um, <coughs> this will show you both the <coughs> error and the and the random error combined. So strictly speaking, it's, it's not quite it's not exactly the comparison you would make. You would compare the red one with standard deviation. Um, but apart from that, what was the what was the question again? I mean, you know, actual if you look at your error terms, and you look at that. Whatever you do, the information comparison in the two sets of equations are the same, essentially, right? If you use the same set of calculations. Uh, in principle, yes. In, in one of these idealized situations. Um, so if it isn't, it means there's some measure of non non ideal conditions, which we like to know about so we can try and remove that. Okay, let's. If there's. Are there any other questions about that before I go to the, the practical? Because it would be worth, if there are questions, we should deal with them. We'll save time later. Yeah. Yeah, can I ask about uh, using these um, uh, observations that uh, are given in very different resolution from what we are uh, providing the product output? Is that uh, taking into account, for example, using some correlation length method or something? Or uh, what is the way? Well, it, it's true, well, estimating the representativeness error, mm -hmm. adding to the instrument error, mm -hmm. and using that for how much weight we give to the observation. Mm -hmm. Then try and go back to the example of the average temperature mm -hmm. over a grid box. <coughs> um, you could get a situation where the model has got that average temperature right, but if you went out and made two observations, they wouldn't record on the thermometer yeah, yeah. Those, that, that average temperature because the, the thermometer over here is responding to the local conditions and the thermometer over there is responding to the local conditions. So those are the situations where the observations don't agree with the value that you would want the reanalysis to produce. And so that's why we add the representativeness to the observations and not to the not to the background, because we're saying that the the target value is not a point value at a particular place in the middle of the grid box. The target value is the average value over the over the grid box. And if we were to make many many point measurements, none of them would agree precisely with the with the average value, they will be spread about the average. So it's the observations that have a an uncertainty distribution or a deviation from the target value. And so that's why this representativeness to do with like fluctuations on a much smaller scale are folded into the observation error. So do you use a service description of subpixel resolution? to make this representative. So there's different, different ways you can get at it. One is to use finer, finer resolution simulations. Um, for things like wind, you can use arguments about what you think is the energy spectrum of, of wind. You know, these things like k to the minus 5 thirds laws for the, the power spectrum of kinetic energy. Uh, and kinetic energy is like mu squared plus b squared, which is exactly the sort of um, quantity you need to integrate to get the, the variance on the small scales. And the other way to do this empirically, actually, is to say, you look at these O minus Bs, you see what, what value this comes to, you know how much of it comes from background error. Uh, so what's left is this thing called observation error, which would be assigned. And after that, you know there are two contributions. One is the instrument error, and then what's left is quite often uh, chosen to be the, the representative area. But then that's sort of like internally self, it's, it's consistent by construction because you've chosen the representative area so that these things lie on top of each other. But then you would want to take that derived quantity and check it against some of these other theoretical things like either the energy spectrum or, or higher resolution simulations. So you can still use it in a way to to pull out a, a consistency check, as it were. Any 
evidence on that? Uh, we had a we had a we had a problem uh, a few weeks ago where actually uh, spots you move to look at the real time data of uh, a quarter grid and then compared to a final grid uh, production. Okay. Quite often you know, the fields are different. If the average the final grid and the quarter grid are different for the quarter plan out in, in actual application. Uh, I mean for, for, for the interim of course the students are easily understand the question. What I suggest is we get people started on the on the practical for the ones who want to who want to like um, download some data sets and maybe we can formulate a more precise question um, while that's going on.